Hey guys, so today we have another concept car video and we're going to take a look at the Chrysler Atlantic, a retro luxury car that was inspired by Bugatti. If you're not familiar with my other concept car videos, make sure to check those out in the top right corner, as I've done many on the other various Mopar vehicles. You can find the video outline on screen, where today we are going in-depth on the background info, exterior and interior, performance, future plans, and looking at why the Chrysler Atlantic was cancelled. So let's get started. So the Chrysler Atlantic was a retro two-seater rear-wheel drive coupe built by Chrysler in 1995. The 1990s were an important time for Chrysler, and they were making a ton of these concept cars. They wanted to make fresh new models for the public, and like we went over with some of the other concepts, they had been searching for a flagship vehicle, creating other prototypes like the 1993 Thunderbolt, 1997 Phaeton, and the 2000 Kronos. After all, Plymouth had the Prowler, Dodge had the Viper, but Chrysler had nothing to show off as the face of their brand. There are various stories that illustrate how exactly the Atlantic was created. Way back in 1994, Chrysler Design Chief Tom Gale and the President Bob Lutz were judges at the Pebble Beach Concours d'Elegance, which is an automotive charitable event held annually in Pebble Beach, California. It's very prestigious, taking place at Pebble Beach Golf Links, and people enroll their collectible vehicles in different classes, where each car is judged for authenticity, function, history, and style. Aside from the judged vehicles, there were also several concept cars. The two Chrysler guys decided that the next year, they wanted to bring a Chrysler concept that would, quote, put all the other concepts back on their trailers, end quote. The story goes that Lutz sketched some ideas on a napkin and gave them to Gale, and Gale gave the Chrysler design team the project, but without the sketches, as he wanted to see what they would come up with without any other influences. They were simply told to use ideas and features from 1930s French coupes, and the result was the 1995 Chrysler Atlantic that was designed by Bob Hubbock. The main inspiration ended up being the Bugatti Type 57, which was a grand tour that was produced by Bugatti from 1934 to 1940 in France. The Atlantic name was perfect, as it also could have been written in French, Atlantique, and there were a couple of Type 57 Atlantic production cars as well. Other similar inspirations included the 1938 Talbot Lago T150 SS Coupe and the 1948-1954 Jaguar XK120. So now we can focus more on the exterior design and also on the Bugatti Type 57. Again, this was the major influence for the Atlantic. Ettore Bugatti built boats, aircraft engines, an airplane, and sports racing vehicles. Despite Bugatti being Italian-born, his company, Automobiles e Bugatti, was established in Molsheim, Alsace, then a German town, but now a region of France. Bugatti's vehicles were known to be fast, luxurious, and technologically advanced, and one of his vehicles won in the first Monaco Grand Prix. He has a few famous responses to customers complaining, one about the brakes, which Bugatti responded, quote, I make my cars to go, not stop, end quote, and another about a car not starting in the winter morning, which Bugatti responded, quote, sir, if you can afford this car, you can surely afford a heated garage, end quote. As for the Type 57, it was actually designed by his oldest son, Jean Bugatti. There were many different submodels of the car, all produced in very limited quantities. The Type 57 had a 3.3 liter straight 8 engine that made 135 horsepower, good for a 95 mile per hour top speed, while the weight of the vehicle was around 2,090 pounds. Later variations would include a 57S and 57SC, the S meaning Serbasse, or lowered, and the C meaning Compresseur, or supercharger. That pushed the output to 200 horsepower and a top speed up to 120 miles per hour. Finally, there was just one 1936 Type 57S Atlantic, and four copies of the 1936 to 1938 Type 57SC Atlantic, supposedly named in honor of designer Jean Bugatti's friend, Jean Mermoz. He was a pilot that was one of the first to cross the South Atlantic by air, but unfortunately his plane malfunctioned and crashed into the Atlantic Ocean in December of 1936. The previous Type 57 was called Aerolith, and this version was supposed to be called the Coupe Aero, but Bugatti changed it to Atlantic in honor of his late friend. The Type 57 was the most popular Bugatti, with 750 created in a variety of body styles, and it won the 24 Hours of Le Mans in 1937 and 1939. This is known as the world's oldest active sports car race and endurance racing, held annually since 1923 near the town of Le Mans, France. 
instead of winning by time and being the fastest like typical races, this one is won by the car that covers the greatest distance in 24 hours. Tragically, just two months after the conclusion of the 1939 race, Sean Bugatti died in a car crash while testing a Type 57 race car near the factory, swerving off the road to avoid a drunk cyclist. So now we've covered the inspiration for the Atlantic concept, and finally we can get back to the actual car. So it immediately strikes you as retro as it's supposed to, with the upright grille, a very long hood, short deck, and pontoon, or flat bottomed fenders. The Chrysler designers definitely made this thing reminiscent of those old Bugattis. The Chrysler winged badge is front and center, and the car seems divided with a line running from nose to tail, giving it a slightly bent front and rear windshield. The rear end is really smooth and round, sloping downwards. Instead of traditional taillights, Chrysler chose to put a thin strip of lights with neon brake lights, and under that you can find the dual exhaust pipes. I will say that looking at it head on makes it look very strange, like some type of animal or even eagle, but otherwise it looks good for most of the other angles. As for the dimensions, despite it being a coupe, this is one very long vehicle. The Atlantic is 199.5 inches long and 75.8 inches wide, a full 2.7 inches longer than a 2006 Chrysler 300C, which was 196.8 inches in length, including the additional two doors. The wheelbase was only 128 inches, again more than the 300C, which was 120 inches. Despite the length, the height was only 51.6 inches tall, which is just 4 inches taller than the Dodge Viper. The wheels were gigantic for 1995, 21 inches up front and 22 inches in the rear, all chromed out and perfectly fitting the overall design of the Atlantic. It looks extravagant, but that was the goal. As design head Tom Gale said, quote, We did the Atlantic because it was just so outrageous, end quote. The interior wasn't as retro as the outside, but it was still elegant and luxurious. Unfortunately, there just aren't very many pictures to show you inside. There was a two-tone theme with cream-colored leather seats, lower dashboard, and door panels. The upper half of the dashboard, center console, and A-pillars are maroon-colored, and it contrasts really well together. As for performance, it threw it back to the Bugatti Type 57 as well. That older vehicle had a 3.3-liter straight-eight engine, and Chrysler wanted to do the same for the Atlantic. They got the engineers to use two of the 2.0-liter four-cylinder engines that were from the Dodge Neon and combine them, resulting in a 4.0-liter dual overhead camshaft straight 8 power plant with 360 horsepower. That was paired with a 4-speed automatic with auto stick, where you could shift manually. The Atlantic also had 4-wheel disc brakes with ABS, and Viper components were used for the 4-wheel independent suspension. So Chrysler had wanted to somehow bring the Atlantic to production, built in a series of 100 vehicles. This part is a bit repetitive from the Chrysler Phaeton video, but at the time of the Atlantic release in 1995, Chrysler had 8 vehicles in their lineup, with the Chrysler LHS sedan leading the way, starting at $29,595,000 US. Most of the Chrysler vehicles didn't convey premium luxury vehicles that the Chrysler brand wanted to be represented by, and they also lacked a true flagship model to lead their lineup. After all, Dodge had that Viper with the supercar-like performance, and Plymouth had the Prowler, an odd vehicle that grabbed the attention of just about everybody. The Atlantic was a vision for the evolution of the Chrysler brand image, fusing style, performance, and heritage together in one stunning vehicle. And the best part, the Atlantic was Chrysler's example of automotive art, a tribute back to the 1930s when many vehicles were handcrafted by skilled craftsmen like Atore and John Bugatti and their Type 57. Chrysler wanted to bring that retro look back to their lineup, and possibly have the Atlantic as the future face of their brand. As we now know, the Atlantic never made it to production. It would have needed more to be street legal, like federally approved bumpers. There is a bumper standard in the US that requires front and rear bumpers on passenger cars. There is a bumper standard in the US that requires front and rear bumpers on passenger cars to prevent damage to the car body at barrier impact speeds of 2.5 miles per hour across the width and 1.5 miles per hour on the corners. That's more of the technical stuff, but this is basically equal to a 5 mile per hour crash with a vehicle of the similar weight. So that means that the Atlantic would have required bumpers on both ends, between 16 to 20 inches above the ground, in order to go to production. Manufacturers can add the bumpers however they want, so Chrysler could have done something similar to the Prowler, where Plymouth added these solid grey or black bumpers to the front and rear, but still that would have totally compromised the design. 
In the end, the Atlantic was too impractical to manufacture due to the regulations and high cost of production. Not to mention that mashup of the two four cylinders was totally untested, so the car was cancelled. Now we can close out the video with a few more comments. Even though Chrysler left the Atlantic as a concept, they kept searching for a flagship with new concepts every few years, like the 1997 Phaeton, 2000 Kronos, and even the 2006 Imperial, all with very similar designs and themes. The 300C sedan came out for 2005, so that finally gave Chrysler the proper flagship, but quite a bit less outrageous than this one. To borrow words from Chrysler, quote, it is a living, breathing example of automotive design as art, expressed in the technological expertise of Chrysler, end quote. The Atlantic was part of the Walter P. Chrysler Museum in Auburn Hills for many years, and still shows up at events from time to time. It would have been nice to see just any one of these retro concepts make it, and I think that it would have helped Chrysler's fortunes. To borrow words from Chrysler, quote, it is a living, breathing example of automotive design as art, expressed in the technological expertise of Chrysler, end quote. The Atlantic was part of the Walter P. Chrysler Museum in Auburn Hills for many years, and it still shows up at events from time to time. It would have been nice to see just any one of these retro concepts make it, and I think it would have helped Chrysler's fortunes. If the Prowler made it, surely the Atlantic could have as well. Chrysler kind of followed through on the retro approach with the PT Cruiser, out for the 2001 model year, but it definitely wasn't the same. So that's the end of this video guys, what did you think of the Chrysler Atlantic? Hope you enjoyed it and make sure to like subscribe for a lot more Mopar content and let me know if you want to see other concept car videos like this one. I'll see you guys in the next video.